Director Tim Burton is here with such films as Batman, Edward Scissorhands, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and Ed Wood. He has established himself as one of the great visionaries of cinema. Do you know that I saw you perform Dracula in Poughkeepsie in 1938? That was a terrible production. Ranfield was a drunk. I thought it was great. You know, you're, you're much scarier in real life than you are in the movie. Thank you. giving away free money. And where is the Batman? He's at home! Who was in his time? <laughs> Things change. <sighs> Meow. <laughs> Deadly black tarantula. Now, if I look at those films, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> what do I what do I come to understand about you if I look at those films? That I'm a mess in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> that I got problems somehow. No. <laughs> now what do they say? I mean that's a range of Yeah, well I mean I've Or always, is there a common denominator? Well, I I grew up watching sort of fantasy films that were always um seemingly uh, things that were, weren't real in a way, but th th that always spoke to me. So I've always been fascinated by things that, that are fantasy, but you try to tap into some sort of real feeling with it. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I've been lucky to make movies because I feel like I get to work out all of my psychological problems. <laughs> <laughs> hell with a psychiatrist exactly. if you can be a filmmaker. Exactly. Yeah. Do you, I mean, is it in... I'm not sure how serious you were about that, but is it really an opportunity, in a sense, to think about yes, I think, uh, what it, fascinates you and what conflicts are within you and what ideas that you are struggling with? Absolutely. I've always liked the idea of folk tales and fairy tales because, again, they present symbols of images that, that are, again, seemingly not real, but somehow you know, always try to think about something that feels real to me you know because life does seem crazy it does seem surreal uh, I'm always amazed when people think that things are normal because nothing is normal everything is is is, is amazing and surreal so uh, I always just tried to present that uh, philosophy in in the film somehow now can we do some kind of Freudian analysis of you and figure out where this comes from well you could try <laughs> But do you, I mean, do you know, can you go back and say the thing that turned me on as a kid was? Well, I try, uh, well, I grew up watching monster movies. Yeah, I, no my parents told me before I could walk <laughs> or talk that I was loved monsters, and uh, I was never afraid of them, always related to them. And I think uh, as everybody, you know, depending upon their upbringing, uh, gravitates to something, I, I gravitated towards monsters because I felt connected to them somehow. And I think... Uh, you know, it's perhaps just sort of growing up in an environment, you know, in Southern California where you, you, you're, you know, you don't have weather really, you, 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 you don't, it's not a real heavy, strong emotional content. So I always saw monsters in those kind of environments as a way uh, somehow of how I felt inside. So uh, they were very uh, cathartic for me. All right, take a look. Having said that, explain where Sleepy Hollow fits. This film based on Washington Irving's novel. Yeah. Well, I grew up, you know, like every child, knowing the image of the headless horseman. And I think I, I it's funny, I talked to a lot of people about this, and everybody th thinks they know this story, but I actually, well, myself included, hadn't really read the story until recently. Yeah. But somehow it's in your consciousness as a, as a child. And uh, I'd seen the Disney cartoon, which I, I, I had loved. But uh, 
there's something that's just very powerful about the image of a guy with no head. And I, I think uh, one of the aspects I loved about the film is you have the Ichabod character who's very much in his head and thinking too much about things versus a guy with no head. And I just like that juxtaposition of that. And somehow the image of the headless horseman somehow to me represents just the subconscious. It's something where most people look, you know, to... Right. To, to eyes and somebody's to, to either categorize or to sort of look at them and, and, and connect with them. There's something about this character that moves around without a head elegantly and strongly that just sort of just taps into uh, the subconscious somehow. Having said that, take a look. We've got a trailer here, which is a... Uh, I never know whether directors put trailers together or not. Did you put this together? Well, we give them a little bit of guidance, but they did a good job with this. I didn't have to go too far. I, I liked what they did. So you've seen it, so you oh, know yeah. what we're going to say. Yeah. Roll tape. This is the trailer from Sleepy Hollow. We'll talk about the making of the movie with Johnny Depp and others in just a moment. Tell me about casting, because you got a good cast here. Yeah, yeah. It, it was amazing, because we shot it in England, but it was like this great sort of international, you know, we used to have great British actors and then some Americans, and it was just a, you know, making a film is such a, it's such a kind of a family experience in a funny way, and uh, to have this weird mix of all these different acting styles all kind of in there, together was like so surreal. I think the most surreal moment was when I first walked into the room and seeing all of these people together. I just, I thought I was dreaming. <laughs> That's what makes it for you. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, people often think that I, I just care, like the movies look good or whatever, which I don't even know what that means. Uh, I, I, the actors are the ones that bring it to life. And especially when you're doing something like this, it's not completely real and you're trying to make feel real. They just, they just make you laugh because they're, you know, they're trying to make this weird stuff come to life and give it a believability. So they're, they're the ones that, that really um, bring it to life. Take Michael Gambon, the great Gambon. That's great. Do you direct him or you just say, this is what we're going to do today? No, you don't really, I mean, with all these great people, they give you such a range, you know, you, and, and they, they've been through so much, you just got to kind of do this or that, you know, they, and they get it, they give you the range of it, and, uh, uh, you know, and that's why these kind of things, you know, we, we tried to, to, to build all the sets, we didn't shoot any of the actors in front of blue screen, because you get such great actors, you know, you want to make it feel as present as possible, so we just tried to give it, to make it an environment to where they could act and do what they do best. Johnny Depp, third yeah. film. Yeah. What's it about, you and Depp? Well, you know, I love actors who like to transform. You know, I like, there's something that, again, is part of the surreal thing of making a film is like when you see somebody who's not the way they really are and acting in a certain way and being believable, it's just extremely exciting. And then you see from film to film, you know, it's like Edward Scissorhands, he doesn't speak. Ed Wood, he doesn't shut up, and this one, he's somewhere in the middle of there, you know? And so uh, it's exciting to see that, and I really get a lot of energy out of, um, of, of, of somebody like him who, who, who you know, doesn't care how he looks, uh, is willing to do anything. It's just very liberating. It makes, it makes these kind of films, which are somewhat more technical, um, just that much looser and spontaneous and, and, uh, and fun. And you share this view that, that he expressed to me and he's seen later in this program, that, that somehow that most of life, which you said earlier too, which most people think is normal, both of you find a little bit absurd. Well, you know, it's like growing up, very early on in life, is everybody is sort of put into categories, you know? And I, I don't know how I got put into the weird category, because I never felt strange <laughs> yeah, anyway. Right. Um, who put you there? I, I, uh, it just seems like society has a way <laughs> right. of kind Burton of... Burton is over here. Yeah, and you know, like you're not... You're, this person's good at sports, this person isn't, this person's weird. You know, right, and right, that happens, right. like, from the very beginning, exactly. you know? And so being put into that category, you're kind of set aside so you kind of feel like outside looking in and so therefore everything does seem strange everything does seem because right off the bat you're kind of going well I don't feel weird but people are saying I'm weird so then you start sort of seeing things from a different perspective that way and so 
but I'm glad of it because I think that's you know the way it is. It's uh, life is strange and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that is your in the end your yeah, take. Yeah, I, I I I I've never felt like the films I've done are really dark because I feel like the, I I feel quite hopeful and I feel like life is a mixture of things and that's why I've always intrigued by t the tone of things where you're trying to mix humor and drama and happiness and sadness and everything all together because that I, I've never met anybody that feels one way at every you know what I mean it's yeah, like you're it's yeah. just we're comprised of many different feelings all at once and uh, this is sort of on an extreme level try to portray that what are you thinking when you look at a scene when you're watching it and it from off behind camera well it's it, the hard thing about most of the films I've worked is you can't sort of exactly know what you're getting until you're there you know I mean you can't sit in a room with actors and kind of because it's all you know it all it's the costumes the lighting the look and acting the camera move everything at once to then create that right tone and I just try to look for for the case where it's just uh, where it's just it's a little bit heightened, but it still feels real. And it's something that, uh, like I said, I've been very lucky to work with people that kind of just zoom, nail that tone. But at the level of sophistication you work in terms of talented people, not only actors behind the camera and script and all that stuff, do you normally, when you, at the end of the day, I mean, you may now look at the videotape instantly, but I mean, do you, whenever you look at what's recorded either on tape or a film, find that 99% of the time, what you got is what you saw as you were watching it. Well, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Because you you have a sort of a, you try to have some sort of an emotional barometer too, to where you kind of it's a, a you know I, I rely more on my um, my sort of emotional uh, response than I do my intellectual response sometimes because I think my my intellectual mind has a has a tendency to to delude my you know to to kind of talk myself in or out of things <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. and if you feel it then. It just is more real and it's more right to me. I feel more comfortable with that. You mentioned that in films there are moments, there are times that, that sort of make it for you. What was it in Sirs of Hands? Oh, there's many. I mean, I, I, you know, you try, you try to make it all. I, I think there were moments like that one and there were moments like with Vincent Price that that was very meaningful to me. I was very lucky to, you know, because he and he was such an inspiration and grew up watching him that that he did that part uh, of of edward's uh, creator so to speak that uh, which is very emotional for me and very very like that's where you feel like that's where you sort of time travel a little and you realize god you're making this is like a dream come true for you and it's 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 very very uh, magical and special and you feel like you're kind of floating a little bit because uh it, it's like right in front of your yeah. eyes and 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 and, and it's stuff that people don't see you know the lights and all i mean when you step that's what i always love about fellini films it's like he captured yeah. the sort of magic of making films you know and and there's so many things that 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 that, that just make it wonderful that Isn't it way. amazing you sat there as a kid watching vincent price saying wow this is touches me resonates with me i like this whatever it is and then you're creating with him yes yeah, it's it's years it's, later it's it's the most surreal. It's like it's where life and dream come together, and that's it. Yeah. All right, take a look at this. This is from Ed Wood. As you said, with Edward, you, there was no talking. With Ed, there's all talking. Here it is. The title of the film, Bride of the Atom. Ah, atomic age stuff, huh? I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's more like real life than uh, you yeah, know. we know. <laughs> we'll think about it, sir. <laughs> but you have choices now. I mean, you can pretty much. You know? It's funny. I learned fairly early on that it actually doesn't get any easier. It, it, funny, and I, and I know time has a way of sort of, is it further gets away, sort of romanticizing things. But in some ways, like doing Pee Wee's Big Adventure was the easiest job I ever got. And he some, brought that to you, didn't? Yeah, he? I mean, it was, it was, you know, they'd seen a couple of the short films that I'd done, and and, but then you kind of then you get lucky with some success, which is somewhat luck. And then you get sort of targeted, and you become like something that they then they, it becomes an expectation, in a way, and that makes it harder. It makes it harder because they always feel, no matter how 
much success you get, uh, or me, they always still feel like I'm a somewhat of a loose, d d not quite all there or something or whether. So does that offend you? I mean, I'll come back to and so, but does, yeah. that, does that sort of? I, you know, I've care. grown up with that. The, I felt that my whole life, so it doesn't really yeah. bother me. So anymore. whatever their perceptions of you, you don't care. No, I mean I. Ca I care when it affects getting something done, which yeah. that's when I care. I mean, because really, you know, it, it's such a big process. It's like pushing a rock up a hill. You know, you 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 you, you just you know you want to meet with as little resistance because the process itself is such a, a a process. But here's the question: If there was no studio to deal with, to deal with, would you be making different kinds of films than you're making? No, I, I feel quite lucky and, and quite in, a, in an interesting niche because I, I basically came into this business through the studio system in the sense that I worked at Disney. Every film I've done, I've never really done, I guess, an independent film, so to speak. Uh, and yet I always felt lucky that I've always, uh, with the material I've had, I've gravitated towards and I've, I, I feel, you know... I, People ask me, like, how did I get into it? I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's like this weird sort of surreal process that I've just been able to and been lucky enough to, to, to do it. So, you know, for as much problems as I've had, I, I've also been very lucky and, and been very supported by them as well. So it's, you know, like everything, it's got its yin and yang. Yeah. Where is Beetlejuice in your own heart and soul? Well, that was great because um, after Pee-wee's Big Adventure, I kept getting these scripts like cookie cutter kind of like you know Hollywood sort of scripts and I, was, I couldn't read it you know, one after another. Then I got this script and I, thought, I realized this I can't believe anybody wants to do this. This doesn't make any sense. There's no story. There's no real through line and um, what was great about that it was the first film that was probably the most improv film I've ever worked on yeah. where the very lucky the people were good at, at that you know like Michael Keaton and Catherine O'Hare, all those people were good at sort of, and, and it, it really unleashed something in me. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I really enjoyed this sort of improv. Uh, and and t to this day, I was always amazed that the studio wanted to do it. I, I, I still can't believe it. And uh, it was great. Mm. Is there somewhere within you lurking a movie that you desperately want to make? You know, that you've been thinking about some classic novel or some story or some something no I think I, I like I said I try to think about that's why I can't never really know what I'm gonna do next because you try to you know it's like getting over a relationship you you kind of have to get over it before because you yeah. have to spend so much time on something so you know so the process you create a family and it's hard to it, it, disengage it, it's disengage and also emotionally you, know, you you finish something you don't know exactly how you're gonna feel and so uh, I, I and that's why I, I try not to go here I try to go here and you know that's why if I'm sketching or drawing sometimes an image will come up I, and, and it keeps coming up without me thinking I, I listen to that or I look at it and I think oh I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this you know I try to to, to, to develop things more um, from that place than, than this place. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you. It really is. Yeah, that was to great. You. <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks a lot. I appreciate it. <laughs> Tim Burton, the film is Sleepy Hollow, starring Johnny Depp and others. We'll be right back with Johnny Depp.